Our scripture passage this morning is Matthew 9, 18 through 34. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one else knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Father, our song is also our confession. Our days are numbered. We were made to walk with you. But we confess that all too often we look to the world and we forsake the King of Kings. But our hope is in our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Though we fall, his love is sure, for he has paid for every failing, and we are his forevermore. Father, pray that you'd be with our veterans, especially ours, and especially those that know you, believing veterans, many of whom are frustrated and disappointed. Would they put their trust and hope and identity in you? And would you continue to use them for your glory? Would you continue to conform them to the image of Jesus? Pray for many of those who are sick this morning and many of those who are caring for the sick. God, it's a, it can be a very tiresome, weary task, but I pray for caretakers in our congregation, those that are here, those that can't be here, that you would be with them, that you would empower them, energize them, help them to see that as they give of self and really hard work for the good of another, that ultimately they are your vessels, your means, your instruments, and it's you that are caring for their loved ones through them. We're thankful for your word this morning. As Moses said, your word is our very life. Would you make it so this morning? We pray this in the name of the high king of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God for all eternity. Amen. Well, in the 1940s, a very famous liberal New Testament scholar, which by the way, this was news to me when I went to seminary, maybe it's news to you. Did you know that most Bible scholars are very liberal? Just so you know, very few actually take God at his word. Well, there was a very famous one by the name of Rudolf Boltmann, very influential. And he said this, he says, we cannot use electric lights and radios and in the events, in the event of illness, avail ourselves of modern medical and clinical means, and at the same time, believe in the spirit and wonder world of the New Testament. What this Bible scholar is saying is that we've moved past the primitive thinking in the Bible. We can't believe in miracles anymore. And then, of course, with the onset of Darwin's theory, atheists now insist on the empirical method. We can only believe what we can see. But that very claim betrays the empirical method, doesn't it? What about that very statement that we can only believe what we can see? Where'd that come from? That doesn't grow on trees. It's like a drunk who insists on looking for his lost car keys under the street light on the grounds that the light is better there. 
They claim there's no supernatural cause. There can be no supernatural cause for any natural phenomenon. But we always want to push that a little bit because those who deny the possibility of miracles must be honest and realize that what they're saying is there really can be no God who does miracles. To be sure that miracles could never happen, one would have to be sure that God doesn't exist. Of course, no one can prove that. But if you can rule out miracles, then you could rule out God himself. I love the honesty of Harvard biologist Richard Lewontin. He says this. He says the scientific community has a, he calls it an a priori, Latin for beforehand, a pre-commitment. The scientific community has a pre-commitment to materialism, the idea that there's only matter, there's only physical thing, there's nothing beyond the material. The scientific community has an a priori commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, our pre-adherence to material causes. You hear what he's saying there? It's not that we find it, we just have this commitment that it can only be the material world. Notice what he goes on to say though. We, speaking on behalf of the scientific community, not the whole scientific community, but many, we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And so they're going to set up an empirical method that won't allow God to have anything to say. But if there is a God, the creator, if God created the world out of nothing, he can arrange parts of it as he pleases. And he does. Rarely. And at special times, but he does. And especially in the ministry of Jesus, his son. Jesus is a miracle worker, among other things. What we've seen in the Gospel of Matthew is he's bringing about the kingdom, the dawning of the new age, the new creation. That's why the Gospels and Acts are so filled with miracles, to show the dawning of the promised kingdom. Let me read to you from the book of Isaiah, one of many promises about the coming of the kingdom. When it comes, what would be happening? This is from Isaiah chapter 35. In that day, he says, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, our, your God will come with vengeance, with recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the deserts. We see this abundance of miracles because the vision of Isaiah is coming to pass. That's why Jesus comes, John the Baptist comes. What is the main message of their ministry? The kingdom of God is at hand. Miracles, they're the restoration of the natural order, not the interruption of it. Signs and wonders are a preview of what the new earth will be like. It's a glimpse of the way the world will be. It's evidences of a coming kingdom that's invaded the here and now. The kingdom is already here in the first century, but it's not yet fully consummated. Here we are in between the times. And Jesus begins to make things right, but one day all things will be made right. That's how one pastor puts it. He says, Jesus' miracles are not just a challenge to our minds, but a promise to our hearts that the world we all want is coming. Which is why sometimes God heals us in this age, but often he doesn't. But here's what we've got to believe. One day he will, fully and finally. By the way, D.A. Carson puts it. He says, I'm not suffering from anything right now that a good resurrection won't fix. You know, the prosperity gospel, which we hate at this church, it comes straight from the pit of hell and is being exported from America all over the world. They're right that God will heal his people. 
They just have the timetable wrong. Right now, sometimes he will, but sometimes he doesn't. But eventually, he will. They have what we call an over-realized eschatology. Jesus brings healing to every one of his children. But sometimes, for some of us, it won't happen until the resurrection. But it is happening. So miracles are a glimpse. That's what they are here. It's a glimpse of the kingdom that Jesus is bringing, but they also attest to the message. Signs and wonders were given to give a glimpse, but attest to the message of Jesus and his apostles. So we should not expect them today like we see them in the Gospels and in Acts. That's why the letters, everything written after Pentecost, rarely mentions them. Listen to the way Hebrews 2 puts it. Since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This message, it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness to the message by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Spirit. So this is what miracles are doing. This is why we see an abundance of them here. And so let's look at some more in Matthew chapter 9. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 9. If you're using one of our Bibles there in the chairs, it's around page 763, 764. And if you don't have a Bible, feel free to take that one with you. As you're turning there, let me remind you where we've been. Let me remind you of the structure of the book of Matthew. Remember those first four chapters are really about who he is. Who is this Jesus? What's his identity? And then in chapter 4, verse 23, we have a transition before we jump into the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew puts it this way, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Then we have, of course, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So what's Jesus doing there? He's teaching. He's proclaiming the kingdom. Then we have these 10 miracles that we've been looking at here in chapters 8 and 9, and we're going to end our section in 934 today, and then there's a transitional statement in 935 that he just said in chapter 423, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So here we are in the middle. We've seen teaching, now we're seeing healing And we've seen this recurring theme of his authority because of who he is. And then he teaches as one, chapter 7, verse 29, who has authority. And now we see his authority over nature and over demons and over sickness and even death. He's even able to forgive sins. And his miracles reveal his compassion, show his authority, and affirm his identity. And so let's consider Four more. First, a bleeding woman. Matthew chapter 9, verse 20. Behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. Here you have this nameless woman who's had what is likely a chronic menstrual disorder over a dozen years. Just try to get in her shoes. All she would have known is physical discomfort. Weakness, embarrassment. And on top of that, according to the law of Moses, she was ceremonially unclean. Let me just read a passage she would have known very well. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 25 says this. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, Or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. Twelve years. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean. As in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity, and whoever touches these things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. 
But if she's cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days. And after that, she shall be clean. And on the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for her unclean discharge. Side note, aren't you so thankful to be under the new covenant? As our grandparents would sing, free from the law, oh happy condition. But this woman, she was unclean, she was isolated, she was incurable. Mark, the gospel of Mark said she suffered much under many physicians and spent all that she had, but was no better, but rather grew worse. Luke says she had spent all of her money. She was broke and could not be healed by anyone. And because she was ceremonially unclean, she was very likely unable to marry. No one could touch her. No one could touch anything she said on or laid on. She would have had an extremely challenging life. She would have been a social outcast, which shows her boldness for entering these crowds. She's heard about this prophet, and she doesn't say a word. She has confidence in who he is, and she reaches out, and she touches the edge of his cloak. Perhaps she's afraid of making this holy man unclean. She won't grab him. She won't touch him, but let me just touch the edge of his garment, for she thought to herself, If only I touch his robe, I'll be healed. Jesus turns and looks at her. Oh, man, I can't wait to see that look. And Jesus says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Be encouraged, daughter. Can you imagine how sweet the sound was to her ears? to hear the voice of her king and to hear these words, to hear him say, you are well, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And she trusts him and she's healed. She came in trembling and she leads triumphing. You know, our faith may be weak. Our faith may be feeble, anemic even. We may just be grasping just the elementary, just the rudimentary elements of the gospel message. But do you know what the central question is this morning, friend? Do you trust Jesus? Do you find him compelling? Do you look only to him for pardon for sin and a peace that endures? If so, such faith saves the soul. Now, we we don't want weak faith. Weak faith doesn't bring the joy we could have. Weak faith often lacks assurance. Weak faith makes it harder for us to endure trials, but weak faith connects us to Christ. Just the same as strong faith. If you only touch the hem of his garment, you'll be made well. What you see Jesus doing here is he's rehumanizing the dehumanized. He's cleaning the unclean. Notice the types of people that Jesus has gone after so far. He could have gone after anyone he wanted. But he has this preferential love for those who don't have it together. The broken, the sufferers and the sinners, the leper, the tax collector, the unclean and the impure. He moves toward them. He doesn't move away from sin and suffering. That's not the kind of savior he is. He moves towards brokenness. Flip over just a couple pages in in the gospel of Matthew chapter 12. Where Matthew quotes from the prophet Isaiah, look at verse 17. He's healing people and it says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. What kind of savior would this be? What kind of Messiah? What kind of servant? Behold my servant whom I've chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, to the nations, to the pagans. Verse 19, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will crush. Now, what does he do with bruised reeds? A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he snuffs out. No. A smoldering wick he will not quench. Until he brings justice to victory 
And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. He goes for the bruised reed and he doesn't break it, but he restores it. The, the smoldering wick he brings life to, he doesn't quench it. Psalm 103 verse 13, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. He loves the down and outs. But you know, this healing of the bleeding woman was actually just a detour. Leads us to our second miracle, the dead girl. Look at Matthew 9 verse 18. This is where he was headed when he got interrupted. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. So this ruler, probably a ruler of the synagogue, probably a Jewish ruler, he's a leader. He comes up, but what does he do? He kneels. He kneels down before Jesus. He has faith as well. I mean, what do you say? My daughter's died. What, what do you say next? What does he say? My daughter's died, but she's dead. But if you come, she'll live. Your touch will bring the dead to life. And so Jesus follows him. So far in the Gospel of Matthew, that word follow, it's been used for what people do to Jesus. Here, Jesus follows this man because of his strong faith, and he brings the disciples. Then he runs into the bleeding, the bleeding woman, but skip down past that to verse 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl's not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. In ancient Judaism, it was the norm to hire professional mourners when someone had died. Even the poorest Jewish family had to hire at least two pipers and one wailing woman. How would you like that gig? Sort of like morticians today. I mean, you've got to have a certain personality to take that gig. It was the norm, though. And Jesus says, deuces, go away, leave, step aside. Your services are no longer needed here. Go well for another. Morning here is about to turn to dancing. For she's not dead. She's taking a nap. The New Testament often refers to the sleep, to the death of Christians as sleep. Because on the other side of sleep is an awakening. For us, death's not dead because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. But these professional whalers, they laugh at them. Because they know death. They've seen it. It's their job. Those who've seen death won't soon forget it. The draining of color, the silence, the coldness. The reality that a significant change has taken place. So they mock him. In the 4th century, Jerome said, they that mocked the reviver were not worthy to behold the mystery of the revival. So Jesus asks unbelief to leave the room. And he goes in and he takes her by the hand. Again, touching a dead body would make one ceremonially unclean, just like touching a leper. Let me read from the law, book of Numbers, chapter 5. Numbers 5.2, command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous or, or who has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. You shall put out both male and female, putting them outside the camp that they may not defile their camp in the midst of which I dwell. And the people of Israel did so and put them outside the camp as the Lord said to Moses, so the people of Israel did. A little bit later in Numbers chapter 19, we read this. Verse 11, whoever touches the dead body of any person shall be unclean seven days. But we'll see again and again in the Gospels that when Jesus touches the unclean, rather than him becoming unclean, they become clean. 
And he takes her by the hand. And the pulse cranks back up. Jesus has the power even over death. Of course, this little girl would die again. This wasn't resurrection. This was a recitation. But we see where the world is headed because of the power of Jesus. One day, as Revelation tells us, he will wipe away every tear and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. He heals the dead girl. Then we have two blind men. Look at verse 27. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them. See that no one knows about this, about it, but they went away and spread his fame through all that district. A couple of blind men, they're following, and they're asking for mercy, and they call him the son of David. They know their Bibles. They've been waiting on this one. They had hoped in the promises of God, and they're actually the first ones in the gospel to call Jesus the son of David. Why is that important? Why is that an important title, son of David? Well, because of God's promises to King David, what we call the covenant with David, most, most clearly found in 2 Samuel 7. But let me read from 1 Chronicles chapter 17. What did God promise David? He says, when your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from him who was before you. But I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forever. God had promised David a son. Eventually he would have a descendant, an offspring, and his kingdom wouldn't end like so many of the Jewish kings ended. No, this kingdom would be forever. He would rule for eternity, a kingdom that would not end, a forever king. This fact that Jesus is the son of David is a hugely important part of the New Testament. Remember how the gospel of Matthew starts? This Gospel of Matthew is telling us about who this Jesus is. How does it start? The very first verse, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's who he is. Who is Jesus? We talked about the son of man. We've talked about the son of God. He's also the son of David. It's really important to the writers of the New Testament that God kept his promises in the person of Jesus. The book of Romans is a pretty important letter. The way we start letters is also really important. Notice how Paul starts his letter to Romans. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. One of the first things he tells us about Jesus. This is the son of David. This is the promised one. 2 Timothy 2.8. I love this little gospel in a nutshell. Remember my gospel Remember, sorry, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. God made a promise to David, and he's kept it by sending Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. That's what it means. He's the anointed one. He's the king. He's the son of David, the forever king, the one with an eternal kingdom. And he launched it in the first century. That's why he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, I'm what you've been waiting for. He says, the scriptures are fulfilled in me. And these blind men are the first to see it. Son of David, have mercy on us. And Jesus asks if they believe he's able to do it. They say, yes, Lord. They move from son of David to the Lord. And Jesus says, according to your faith, let it be done for you. Jesus gives sight to the blind. What Isaiah 35 promised is here. As Psalm 146 puts it, Yahweh opens the eyes of the blind. But again, as we saw when Nathan preached a few weeks ago, Jesus heals him and he says, keep it to yourselves. He doesn't want word getting out all over the place yet because their conception of the kingdom was way off. He wasn't going to be a militaristic Messiah who was going to come and 
evaporate Rome. No, his kingdom is spiritual and it's slow. As he'll teach us here in a few chapters in Matthew 13, it starts really small like a mustard seed, but eventually it's the largest tree in the forest. John 18, his kingdom's not of this world. Luke 17, the kingdom's not coming in ways that can be observed. He's looking for disciples who understand his ministry, not fanboys. Those seeking him and his kingdom, not those seeking to benefit from him. Not surprisingly, what do they do though? They disobey. They go and they spread his fame anyway. Then we have a mute man. Look at verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He cast out demons by the prince of demons. This word for mute means he was probably both deaf and mute. And he cast out the demon and heals the man. Jesus gives the freedom to see and to speak. And most here marveled. They were amazed at what they saw, but not all. The Pharisees accused him of being empowered by Satan. They couldn't deny the power. There was. They saw it. But they could wrongly attribute it. And let's remember who the Pharisees were. We tend to think Pharisees and we think bad guys. It wasn't the perception of the first century. The Pharisees were the good guys. The Pharisees were the holy rollers. The Pharisees were the moral majority of their day. They were the ones that were really serious about taking holiness serious. They thought that God hadn't come back yet to restore them and, and launch the kingdom because of their own sin. They thought, we don't have our act together. That's why we're here under the oppression of Rome. This is why God hadn't redeemed us. So they said, let's take the law very seriously and let's add to it. That way, maybe then God will come back. And so these were the very conservative, serious religious leaders, these Pharisees, the Bible thumpers. And these holy rulers attribute the work of Jesus to the enemy. Yet again, we see these Gentiles and these outcasts getting it, but the people of Israel opposed. In some ways, that's the story of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus versus Jerusalem. Remember in Matthew 2, we saw that these pagan Gentile wise men, they come and what do they do? They worship the king. Meanwhile, what does the king of the Jews do? Herod, he tries to extinguish him. And who does Jesus turn to after he preaches the Sermon on the Mount? He turns to the unclean. He turns to a leper and then a Roman centurion in chapter 8. Look at chapter 8. What does Jesus warn there in chapter 8, verse 11? He tells them, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom, Israel, will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then in chapter 9, Jesus hangs out with tax collectors. They were the enemies of Israel and sinners. And what did they say? What did the Pharisees say? Chapter 9, verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And here they call him satanic. And it wouldn't even be the last time. Flip back a couple pages to chapter 12, forward chapter 12, verse 22. Similar situation, a demon oppressed man, blind and mute, brought to him, he healed him. Man spoke and saw and all the people were amazed. Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus says to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus faces this opposition 
against the people of Israel and their leaders, and he will face opposition from his own people till it ultimately ends at Golgotha. It will be a good reminder for us as we walk through Matthew that religious seriousness and religious pedigree doesn't mean anything. Hearts for the Lord does. Well, looking at these four stories, what does Jesus require? Really two main postures. What's he after here? First posture is need. All you need is need. The main qualification for the kingdom is to realize you don't qualify. Brokenness. An awareness of your sin. Contrition. Your despair is his home. His office is at the end of your rope. So that's the first question. Are you aware of your need? Notice what he said. Look, at, look back a page at chapter 9, verse 12. After the Pharisees accused him of hanging out with sinners, notice what Jesus says, 9, 12. When he heard it, he said, those who are well, and it's not that anyone's actually well, it's those who think they're well. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. If you think you're just fine, you think you're good, Jesus has nothing for you. But if you know of your desperation, your need, your sin, your brokenness, Jesus offers grace and mercy and salvation and transformation. You may think you're the least deserving, but if you desire him, he says that those who come to him, he will never cast out. Second posture is faith. Did you notice that emphasis? It's not just in our section. It's really been from the beginning. Look at chapter 8, verse 10. Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Look at chapter 9, verse 2. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic. Chapter 9, verse 22. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. Then we saw it in verse 29. According to your faith. Do you have faith in Jesus? Jesus requires two things. An acknowledgement of your need and faith that he can meet that need. Jesus performs miracles to give us a glimpse of the kingdom. It attests to the message. It reveals his compassion. It shows his authority. It affirms his identity. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Do you see your need for him? And do you believe he's able to meet that need? Let's pray. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Thank you for not leaving us to ourselves, but thank you for sending your son to live a life that we should have lived and die a death we deserve to die, was raised from the dead. Thank you for these ministries that we're able to see, we're able to get in what he's after. And we're so glad that it's not a bar that we can't meet. Oh, the bar is oh so low. And I pray for everyone here that we would realize that we are there. Some of us come here with way too much confidence. And so I pray by your spirit, would you show us our need? Reveal your holiness and our sin that we might flee to Christ. I pray that this would be a body of people that understand their need is oh so great. But we have a great Savior that meets that great need. We pray it in his name. Amen.